what's going on? It's David Avalon here with Robert Drysdale. We're back from the winter vacations. <laughs> Happy Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Uh, we haven't seen each other, I think, no. since uh, well, almost uh, a month, maybe three weeks. Yeah, yeah. Since we did our last show. And, uh, you know, we all needed a break, you know, and it was a nice one, too. Like, I had some, I had to a little vacation with the kids in Maui, which was fantastic. And then when I came back, you had some family in town. I'm right yeah, my, now. well, my parents came in from Christmas. So they came yeah. in Christmas Day, which is really awesome. And uh, I posted about it, but my dad's like the ultimate handyman. So he came in here. He's like, Perfect right. timing. Yeah. He's like, he's no. all right, son, I'm going to show you the ropes. Yeah. Like, yeah. So we did some hardwood flooring. We put in the um, backsplash in the kitchen, a bunch of other stuff. So, and he got me all these tools. So, See, I want to learn handiwork. I just, I don't have the time to learn. But it actually looks fun. You know, the people that do it actually do enjoy it. Like, I'm a decent handyman, but like, there's a lot more I could learn that I would like to. Like yeah. Marcelo, you know, Marcelo does everything. He does his whole house. Yeah, I've seen floor, Instagram. And, like, like, yeah, like, it's yeah. incredible. Like, it looks just, really and, nice. Yeah. He does this about everything. You know, it's a skill. It's a good skill to have. Saves you a lot of money too. Yeah, it does. Um, but uh, it, it's a skill you have to give it time to. It's not rocket science, but it's not something you learn, you know, in, on one try. It right. Takes, it takes a good day of doing the same thing for you to acquire a very basic level skill level at it. Right. It's a lot of trial and error because yeah. it's very simple. Like even playing like the backsplash, it's like what? you put a primer, yeah. you put the mortar. You put the tile, you put the grout, and then the sealer. But it sounds very simple, but the execution. <laughs> and there's a lot of things that can go wrong if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. But it's, it's the kind of stuff you can learn, though. Like, it's not something that, you know, to me, some things are very difficult to learn for some reason. Like, whatever reason, like, they don't click with me. I never felt that, like, manual labor, unless it's something very artistic that requires a lot of fine motor skills. None of it is overly complicated. You know, I look at it, I'm like, okay. And I watch people do it, and I can see the skill. Right, the technical knowledge, but it's not something. Oh, I can never do that. Or there's some things I just look at it and go, "There's no way I can do it." Like drawing, like well, like my daughters draw better than I do. I'm not making this up. Yeah, yeah. They're yeah. six and eight, and they're better than me. Like no joke. I'm like, I can't, I can't. <laughs> you know, like six year old beats me at it. You know, what, what can I do? I think it has to do with your uh, fine motor skills. Like you, like some people. I think men in general have poor. Fine motor skills. It's something to do with testosterone. I think it makes you clumsy. So like women typically have better handwriting, mm, yeah, and yeah. it makes you more. It's a, the muscle. Everything from, from trying to explain it here, but it makes you move. You're more clumsy. Basically, you don't have that ability to really control the pen. That's why my handwriting is bad. I have lots of testosterone. <laughs> no, but yeah, they actually, I read something on this. It actually correlates. It's like it's yeah. one reason why you know it's it's um you know the hypothesis goes. High testosterone levels make like they they hinder your finer motor skills. Well, that could explain a lot because I've always had chicken scratch handwriting. Like man, like yeah, it, terrible. Like drawing a straight line is like yeah, <laughs> it's awful. I also don't hold the pencil the right way, which probably <laughs> I learned. Like I, I grab it like this. I think everybody else grabs it, but like, yeah, I can't. I don't, I, I, I don't know. It's like chopsticks. People are constantly correcting me, and I'm like, is, does it work? Am I, am I having a hard time with the sushi here? No, so let me do my thing, you know? Yeah, so um, but it was cool. So we, we learned some stuff. We got some extra tools. So I got to finish out some stuff around the house. And, uh, it was uh, uneventful other than that. But uh, a lot of stuff going on in the MMA world. We got Conor McGregor making his return. Against He's Cowboy. fighting this Saturday, right? I think, I think, I think it's a Saturday, Saturday. yeah, because I know a lot of people yeah. are in town. Uh, for the event, so one of the things I found it's annoying. Two years, it's been two years since he's fought, right? Yeah, it's, it's been, been a while since he's like fought. Khabib, yeah, that was his last fight. One of the things I found annoying about the marketing of it is that they're not talking about cowboy at all. I don't know if you noticed, but you it's see every about... UFC post is about Connor. Oh, look at Connor's knockout. Look at Connor's the king of the mic. Connor, I'm like, I get that he's being brought in against cowboy because he's supposed to beat cowboy and fuel his next rampage. But it's kind of uh, to me, it's a little disrespectful, like. I haven't is. even but mentioned, like, I haven't seen a promo about Cowboy yet. But I think that UFC has, they're not even hiding their bias anymore and how much of a business they are. Yeah. They are not, like, we envision a fair show, two warriors going into combat. And there's some rules they have to, they, they can't, you know, they, they, they can't favor McGregor in a fight, right? Like, right. he's on his own in there type of thing. But everything else they can help McGregor with. And because it's in their interest that McGregor wins. I was looking at the highest payouts in UFC history, and I can't remember exactly, but I think McGregor is like five out of six. 
at the top six UFC payouts of all time. Yeah. The only one that McGregor wasn't in it was Brock Lesnar and Randy Couture, UFC 100. Yeah. That was the, but like, it was like number four or something. But the other like five were all Conor McGregor. So UFC, they're not even hiding that. They're going for the money, which from a business perspective makes perfect sense. As a fan, of course, I hate that. Yeah. As a fan, as a spectator, someone's been following this sport since 1998. I look, 1997 actually, I look at this and I go, that's bullshit. You know, it's messed up with Cerrone. Like, I don't care how much, how many tickets he sells, it shouldn't matter. Yeah. Right? But, you know, there's a, I mean, even Dana as a fan, he might agree with me. But the business side of him, so you can be conflict. Like, the part, there's a part of Dana that can go, yeah, Cerrone deserves more, you know? But then there's the business side of his that probably takes over. Yeah, but think about how many times we have a conflict within ourselves and we go, oh, I could do this, but what I could do that. And you're thinking, you're going back and forth, and there's normally a tug of war. And one side wins over the other, right? That's pretty standard human, you know, behavior, right? We don't always agree with ourselves, right? You're back yeah, and forth on the topic and, you know, you change your mind too. And I think that Dana, um, I think he is a fan of the sport, but he likes money a lot more than he likes the integrity of the sport. And when I mean but, integrity, yeah. I don't mean anything like as in disrespect for this, the dishonest as in doing what's fair. I think fairness is not on his radar as much as you know, dollars are. Right. I mean, he is, is he still the CEO or the president? Or I think he kept his position. I think he got a cut from the sale of the yeah. UFC, but he, they kept him as with on a salary, I guess. But regardless, it is his responsibility to make the business as much money as possible. So he would be irresponsible to the business if yeah. he wasn't doing what makes the most money. Yeah. It's just unfortunate that it's put in this circumstance where they're, because like you're saying, the UFC is is like a league more than it is like a business. Well, it should be a league more than it is a business. Like you don't see NFL pushing one team over the other. Yes. You know, like if they're going to put like the Raiders versus, you know, the Buffalo Bills. They don't talk, oh, all Buffalo Bills and no coverage of the Raiders. I don't, know, I don't watch football that much anymore, but I don't imagine it's like that. If- I, I'll go to it. I try to make an analogy with football teams all the time because people relate to it too much. And I'm always using the Raiders and the Patriots. I can't remember any other team. And I'm like, I know those two teams. And then I'm like, another one. Like, give me another one. Give me another one. I'm like, ah. I know they're, and I know when, I, when someone tells me, oh, yeah, yeah, I know that team. But like, they're not fresh on my mind because I've never seen a football game in my life. But anyway. Um, you never seen but, one in person? Live? Uh, no, not even oh, wow. on TV. Not even on TV? Not even on TV. Oh, wow. No, I don't even know the rules. I know you're supposed to get a touchdown. That's about it. <laughs> I, I'm not making it. I really don't. Like, I, I can't watch it, man. Like, it's too painful. I sit there. And like five minutes in, I'm like, what is this, man? It's all commercials and stats and people talking. And there's like this much game going on. Yeah. It's like a third of the time there was actually a game going on. The rest of the time, there's nothing happening. It's pretty wild because it's like a three-hour event to watch one oh, game. But it's a 45 that, or 48 minute, I think. Of actual play. Of actual yeah. play. So it's pretty incredible how much filler there is. Yeah. You know? And commercials, all that. Yeah, because I always found it the same way. Like, soccer is even worse. Even I agree. Though the soccer runs a long time, there's a lot of nothing going I on. I can't watch. So- I, I love playing soccer, yeah. but I can't watch it. I probably like play football. It looks fun, but I don't like. I don't enjoy it. I don't even, I'm not even crazy about watching fights, to be honest. Unless it's a friend of mine fighting, I, yeah. I'll skip it. I'm probably not going to watch. I'm not going to watch uh, Cerrone and uh, McGregor. Yeah. I'm probably going to be, you know, I'm coaching a fighter of ours, actually. But uh, regarding the league thing you're talking about, I agree with you. Uh, the thing is, when you're in a, in a fight format like the UFC that's not a league, it gives the promoters, in this case Dana White, the power to create his own criteria in his head. Yeah. So whatever the criteria of the week is, you know, that's the criteria he's going to use. And it gives him the power to change, right? Whereas the NFL does not have that luxury. They can't pick and choose who's going to be in the final. Exactly, yeah. Because they're going to make more money that way, right? I mean, I, I think they would love that if they could get away with that. Think about it. <laughs> they probably would. If the rules were in place yeah. where it didn't matter, because the rules were created 100 years ago, whenever the hell NFL was created. But like that right there was they set the rules, and now people are used to it, and no one would stand for it. But the UFC has always been, they have a ranking system, but the ranking system is not the determining factor. It's no. a guide at best. It's a guide, But yeah. there's, no, there's nothing written in stone that prevents Dana from doing whatever the hell he wants. Yeah, that's that's the thing, right? Like because even though we have the boxing commissions or athletic commissions, they don't really have. I I would try to compare them in my mind. It would have been they should have been like the NFL or the or whatnot that kind of organizes everything, 
sets the rules down so then the other fight promotions have to work within that context you know what i mean but the way it is right now it's kind of still like a free-for-all you know every yeah. promotion is doing their own things and the boxing commissions are just collecting checks pretty much <laughs> of what they're doing i mean i was in it and you were probably in it from the beginning but i remember from florida they used to charge exorbitant rates for promoters like it was like twenty five thousand dollars at one point I, I could have it wrong but i remember it was a crazy steep fee to promote an MMA event. And then the boxing was like a fraction of it. And this was because there was still that bias. They didn't want MMA to grow. Wow. Right? So like all these small shows could never exist. Like they would come and go really fast because yeah, you can't you can't make money off of it. You know, and you weren't on TV or pay per view, you're just running a local show and you're gonna pay like twenty five grand off the gate to the boxing commission. It's like that's just corruption yeah. at its finest, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. and then How, like over man. time now, like I think they're probably making more money off MMA events than they are yeah. boxing events, and they've sort of shifted that. It was that type of manipulation that was going on, but now they're really a passive entity, I think, for the most part, and the promotions are the ones that are calling all the shots, which I don't know. It creates this type of situation where there's more economic incentives to try to chase these money fights versus uh having that integrity you're speaking of of like okay this guy's number two he should be the next guy guy in line for a title shot or for a main event or something like that whereas now we can just make up titles like a bad bad motherfucker title i still i I, what are they thinking (laughs) yeah you know but like it it is a free-for-all it is kind of like the wild west and I, i i think that's long term that's damaging that's the thing about our age. I think that like people are very short-sighted. We don't think too far ahead. They're thinking about me, me, me. There's an excess of, you know, what can I get out of this situation right now without thinking of longevity of things. And perhaps the NFL has lasted for so long because they have that system that even the promoter, like the owner of the NFL may hate, but it's a system that's probably going to last, you know, for as long as, you know, people enjoy watching football, the NFL will probably be there. I could see the UFC going down eventually and turning into something that is like they kind of lose the fans because they don't take them seriously anymore, right? Because they lost those criteria. I think that it's important to keep your base. And I think the UFC has lost credibility entirely with his, their base, right? I think the, the fan who watches NFL and NASCAR is going to watch the UFC for as long as they, they get happy by Connor that, you know, sells them charisma. Regardless of skills, right? I'm not saying Connor isn't skilled, but if he weren't skilled, it wouldn't make a difference. Yeah, he'd still sell tickets. It's his, it's because he's funny, his accent, he talks to talk, he's loud, whatever people. That's what's getting him to sell tickets, not his actual skills. Yeah, right. Um, and but with if you don't have those characters, what are you left with? You know, and your fans, your hardcore fans, are the ones that are going to watch the UFC no matter what. Connor McGregor not, didn't have to if he never opened his mouth again, and no one ever talked again. Guys like me and you would still enjoy the UFC. Yeah. Because we enjoy the skill set. But I feel that UFC has lost that base because their lack of criteria. Right? I mean, we, we watch it still, but we know they're biased. Right? And I think that long term is damaging. I, I think so too. You know, because like, I feel now like I'm seeing all these like Conor ads. It kind of puts me off from Conor McGregor now. Like, I'm. Like, I've never had a bias against him. I thought he's a, actually a pretty exceptional fighter. I think it's phenomenal. Yeah. yeah. And, um, but now it's like they're, I'm being forced. Like, oh, yeah. like this. I'm like, man, you're pushing too hard. You know, like, yeah. let the, the fight do the talking. Yeah, you know? it, it's too much, man. Like, I, if, I prefer if they never talked. I like the Japanese style things. You know, a lot of times I say this, like, oh, that means, I'm not, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I think those are, that's a better moral compass. That's all I'm saying. For us to be respectful, right? Doesn't yeah. make me perfect or you, but you can have a moral compass, right? That's my north. I know that what is right and what is wrong. This is what I prefer, right? And you know, but I understand why. You know, it's funny because like, people always love McGregor. Like almost all of them don't know anything about fighting. It's true. Like if yeah. the people that really, really into these type of people, like the, the the loud mouths and like the trash talking, almost as a rule, they don't know shit about fighting. It's true. Like they're like, oh man, that guy Connor is such a badass. I'm like. And then I could tell the guy didn't know what he was talking about. Like, yeah, yeah. The, the people that know fighting, like, don't make a big deal out of him. Because, like, he's good, but it's, like, a lot of good people in there. He's not exceptionally talented. He's good. He's, I would definitely put him in the top ten in his weight class, yeah. no doubt. But I wouldn't call him the best in the weight class in any weight class, really. Or the top three, really. You know, but 
you know the 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 the, the noise makes up for that, right? Yeah, and he definitely makes a lot of noise. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. But we also have uh, in the grappling world, Chael Sonnen's Submission Underground. They're doing a tag team format now. Yeah. And originally, it was supposed to be Gordon Ryan and uh, Craig Jones, and uh, Chael Sonnen said he'll give twenty five thousand dollars to any team that can beat yeah. those two. Gordon announced his retirement before the new year. <laughs> Which I thought is hilarious. <laughs> it's you know, the it's hilarious thing about that is that he called me out more times than I can count, and I'm like, I, I, it's fair to say that I'm beat up. Like you're, you're beat up. Like it's you know what it does to your body, right? I'm 38. I got like this whole new life, and I get this 23 year old kid calling me out, who then retires at 24, right? And then decides, and other people call him out. Is like, leave me alone. I'm retired. I'm like, I, that's hilarious to me. Like you're, you're, that's great. You retired at 24. Now you're giving people shit for calling you out. Whatever. But I do think the format's interesting. Yeah. You know, so I, now the team matchup is Vinny Magalhães. Oh, I think I butchered the last name. Sorry. Magalhães. It's a very nasal sound. It's a nightmare to say it. Even okay. for even Brazilians, like they have to like almost like pause for a second to say it. Yeah. <laughs> say Vinny M. And <laughs> they say Vinny. Vinny M. And uh, Cal Baum, which bon, I, also, bon. I don't know how to pronounce your name either. Sorry. And then it's uh, Craig Jones with Nick Rodriguez. Yeah. So, that's an interesting. I matchup. got my money on Vinny and Kyle, actually. I well, here's the thing, right? Vinny, he's not gonna get caught, right? Leg locks don't work on him. Now they don't. Yeah, so he's not gonna get caught. Kyle is also very well versed on leg locks. He is. Yeah, and I haven't seen him. Has he been caught in the submission? I know he's been beat by points and stuff like that a lot. He's tough to tap. He fought Felipe at the, the yeah. Quintet. And Felipe blew both his feet. Like he didn't tap. I don't either because it's crazy tough or because he got very flexible. He was like limping out of the, the arena. Like you yeah. could see that he was hurt. And Felipe's got vicious straight foot lock, like the best I've ever seen. So you know he's I, I don't I don't think I've ever seen him get caught. I haven't seen him fight that much. Yeah. I know he had like a rough one with uh, Tim Spriggs, but like I, I haven't yeah, seen even him. there, like no submission. Like, yeah, he, like he got he, rough he, house he, a bit, yeah. but he wasn't submitted. So like in this tag team format. They haven't really laid out all the rules yet as far as how I don't, it's going to work. I, I was going to ask you that. I don't know how it's going to work. I'm mean, imagining it's going to be a submission only type thing. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense. That I, you know, so if that's the case, yeah, I, I would see. I could see Nick getting tapped. You know, yeah, although I, not easily, but I don't. I, 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 you know, I hate. You can't, you can't even. I feel like we're living in a time where even speaking your mind or sometimes the truth and sometimes just giving people facts, you get called a hater. Yeah. Right, and I'd rather speak my mind a little bit, but like, then I mean, people gonna think this hate. I, I think Nick is overrated in a lot of ways in terms of jujitsu. I think his wrestling is very dominant, but even his ADCC performance, everyone's blown away, and he really won with he beat heavyweights with wrestling. Yeah, and that was it, you know. And then he had like a controversial match with Cyborg. I'm not talking about the shenanigans after the fight or anything like, but it was a very close fight. It wasn't he didn't really put Cyborg in danger any time. So there's no like a, a outstanding display of jujitsu. Or of yeah. like submission skills, what I'm saying. Like Craig displays that. I've seen Kyle is very skilled. Vinny, like unquestionably most successful guy in the whole thing. But you know, for me to, I, I, I don't, I don't. I, other than his wrestling, which is good, I don't see him with all those other tools. You know, I think there's a lot more. I think that it's it kind of got blown a little out of proportion. Oh, he's a blue belt. Like Barker was a white belt, and he won the whole thing. Yeah. People forget that. I'm like, that's not unusual in ADCC for a wrestler to walk in there and do really well in the heavyweight division. Yeah. A lot of them have done it before. It's not the first time this happens, but uh, yeah, I think it's because it's part of that like you know outside of IBJJF world kind of little niche that's being created that are really pumping up anyone who's in that little niche. But um, you know, I don't think that he's on par in terms of jujitsu. And I'm not trying to you yeah. know, attack yeah. anyone, but as at, compared to Vinny, Kyle, and Craig, who to me are in terms of jujitsu a lot more skilled. For sure, you know uh, there is to his credit though at the trials. I think he submitted like four people in there, were naked, he had leg lock. He's, he's, so he yes. does have submissions. Let's yes. not say, but again, in the heavyweight division, when he was facing world class competition. It's a different level, it's right? A different level. But those guys, like, um, or at least Craig and Vinny, have shown they can tap out just about anybody yeah. if you let yeah. them. You know, uh, Kyle wasn't in ADCC, so he hasn't faced, I think, that level at least in. Well, actually, no, he he won. I the, think he's there. He's there. He won. He won the BJJ Fanatics Invitational, and he beat uh, what's his name? 
I've seen him beat Kainan. I've Ka- seen Kainan, him beat yeah. Lucas Barboza. Granted, there was yes. like, you know, there were not the rule set where those guys are normally, you know, it was, yeah. you know. But, but still. You but it's these yeah. huge wins, yeah. no doubt. I think he's definitely at ACC caliber. Yeah. I don't think anyone can question that. Um, I don't see, I, I don't see, you know, I don't see Nick being any Vinny or Kyle, to be honest. I just, I mean, it could happen. Yeah. I don't know what the rules are. If it's, if it's, I don't know how it's going to yeah, work. Yeah, the, the right? rules would really determine a lot of it, right? Like, if it's just the first person to submit, yeah. you know, then you might, Craig can win it for the team, I would suppose. I right? wonder if Craig is going to try to footlock Vinny, if he's going to be stubborn enough to do that. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, yeah. Gordon kept going for it over and over. After he went the first time, I'm like, it didn't work the first time. What's making you think it's going to work the second? You know, yeah. like, switch gears, man, do something else. You know, like a little robot doing it over and over and over. Like, and I've trained with Vinny plenty. I don't know if you've ever trained with him. Like, no, I haven't. I've gone for his foot too, man. Like it's it's a waste of time. It's the same thing for his arm. You can extend his arm. Like it doesn't. He's not gonna tap, right? So you, you have to think a little. Okay, I'll move outside of your you know regular tool toolbox and see what else you can do. And for Craig, I think that he has more tools. You know, I just that the question is, is he going to use them? Yeah. And can he get there? Because they're probably not his A game, right? He's going to have to play his B game, so to speak, uh, against a guy like Vinny, because mm-hmm. Vinny will literally give you the foot and let you waste energy trying to footlock him. I yeah. wish I had those ankles. Yeah, him, though, I think someone maybe crazier than him would probably be uh, Jeff Glover. Is he flexible too, Jeff? Oh, God, he is. Is he ever, man? Like, he can turn... Like, let's say he's standing, my feet are like this. He can turn his feet backwards, like this. So he can fully turn his heels on both legs simultaneously, pointing back. Wow. And, like, I've never seen him. I've trained with Jeff before, but we weren't, like, going, like, balls to the wall or anything. So we never, I didn't know that about him. Yeah, he's got ridiculous flexibility in his legs. So he's another guy that you, at least doing an inverted heel hook would never hurt It's huge, man, because you can actually use that to your advantage. You can put yourself in positions and lure your opponent into attacking something. You know he's going to waste a lot of energy. For sure. Well, you know, and, and, and I would do that all day. If I had those kind of ankles, I'd be, like, putting myself in footlocks all day. And I could get at, foot, good, at footlocks myself so I can counter, right? Yeah. So, yeah, huge advantage, no doubt. Yeah. Now, all anatomy, too. Don't ever think that that has to do with, like, practice. So i got to practice getting my heels. There's certain things that get stronger in your body. Your yeah. bone breaks, it actually comes back stronger. You tear down muscle fibers, that actually comes back stronger. Brain damage and ligament damage, not the same, right? <laughs> yeah, not the you same. You can't tweak your ankle every day and hope that it's going to get more. It's not going to work that way. It's, gonna hurt. It's, like, it's like back in the day, and I was, I was just talking to Rafael Alejaro. You met him. He's like a, the conditioning coach. Yes, yes. Box. He's like an outstanding conditioning coach. And he would say that um, back, like back in the day when they first started shootbox, I actually believe it. They got punched in the face a lot. It's like... Gonna make, make it, it tougher. Tough. I don't think they fully understood. Like you know, like yeah. we're not talking about PhDs here. We're talking about you know fighters that you know the technology, the know how, the 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 research. Like none of it was there. We're talking like mid nineties here, right? Yeah. Whatever the hell they they were you know getting started. But that's what they would do. They would just like this is how you're gonna get tough and like your brain is gonna get stronger from getting punched, which is an yeah. interesting approach when you really when you put things in perspective. You're like, wait a second. <laughs> But it's crazy the shit that we believe now, that people believe like 30 years ago that were completely normal. It always makes me think, what are the crazy things that we believe today for what people in the future will be making fun of us? Keto, vegan diets, all this kind uh, I, of Yeah, that. I think all that the there's fads and there's extremes that people yeah. are going to be making fun of us. Like, you really believe that? And like, yeah, we did, you know? <laughs> it's kind of like that friend of yours in high school or, you know, sometimes, in, you know, well into their 40s. And they're, when they, they dress, they're obnoxious about it. Like, they're so, like, they push that boundary, the fashion boundary, like, so hard. And then 10 years later, they look at the pictures and they go, oh, my God. What was I thinking? It's like, the, you know, like, it's like yeah. any, anything that is extreme, you're right. And then, like, 20, 30 years later, it's like... What? what? What was going on there, man? You yeah, know, that was just a funny picture. But yeah, it's the same thing with ideas. It's the same thing with fads. And um, yeah, there's a lot of that going on for sure. Yeah, you know, we tend to think that we're so much smarter than we were in the past. We're just uh, making new foolish mistakes that yeah. <laughs> people don't change. People in the future are we're the same species like... now we were 30,000 years ago, man. Yeah. Like, there's not been any change. Uh, it's funny because, like, whenever this un- unrelated, but yeah. you know, making a bridge, they're like, I, I always like, I-, I hate with a vengeance that show Ancient Aliens. Have you ever seen it? 
And is that the one with the guy's hair that's crazy? Yeah, the crazy, he's a great Greek guy, like his crazy hair, he's like talking, he's so confident about it, right? And it's like so insulting to archaeologists, and it's insulting to Egyptians, and it's insulting to so many people that actually know what they're talking about. Because really what they're saying is like, we're really smart. Those people three, four, five, five thousand years ago were so stupid, they could have not have done it without. I mean, on the historical side, you can raise so many questions claiming that aliens build pyramids. Like, there's so many different ways you can come, you know, answer that. Yeah. It's completely absurd, but it's insulting because the assumption is we're really smart because we got iPhones. You didn't create the iPhone. Don't give yourself credit for something you didn't do to begin with. That is accumulated knowledge over centuries that finally led to an iPhone. That wasn't me or you because no single individual could have done that by themselves. Impossible, right? Uh, but it's really, it's a way of saying like people in the past are dumb. They didn't know. And they were just as smart as we are. In fact, I suspect they're probably even smarter in a lot of ways. They had less access to information, but they were probably hand in like, like figure it out kind of. Yeah. yeah. They're far more handy than we are. They could survive just about anywhere like we can't. Yeah, they had to know? be much more handy, like you said, because they had less tools. Less they, tools. They had, to, they had to know how to make more use of what they had. Yeah. I, that's probably our greatest gift as a species is that we can pass our knowledge. Yeah. And I mean, animals teach each other certain things, but not to the extent that we, that can, we do. That we do. Oh, we yeah. write books. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that they documented didn't survive the test yeah. of time and people plundering and burning libraries and stuff didn't help either. But I know when people were trying to figure out how they make the pyramids, oh, we can't figure it out. It's impossible. It's like, no. You can't figure it out because now you have all these different tools and you only know how to do it with these things. You never learn yeah. how to do it without with, it. Yes. Whereas the, the people from thousands of years ago, they only had those simple primitive they tools. Maximize those tools. But they tools. know how to do it. And I think one of the things people underestimate is when you have a hell of a lot of slave labor, you can accomplish amazing oh, yeah. things. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and and uh, by the way, regarding the pyramids, there's a really good documentary. It's a National Geographic documentary. It's called The Internal Ramp Theory. Mm. And as this French uh, architect, and he's been dedicated his life to figuring out the pyramids. And it's very compelling. It's an internal ramp. They build it in a spiral inside the pyramid. The blocks were dragged inside the pyramid. And the, there's a lot of evidence inside of the pyramid for that. And I, was, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm no expert, but I'm yeah. watching it. It sounds far more convincing, certainly more than aliens. Like, let's cut that one out. But there's like this other one's about a spiral on the outside of the pyramid, which creates all these other problems and a huge ramp going straight to the top, which also creates a lot of problems because it uses more materials in the actual pyramid. Yeah. Right. But uh, the internal ramp one, when he's explaining it, is like, oh, that's really easy, actually. That, yeah, that makes a lot more sense. When watch it, it's called the internal ramp theory. Hmm. It's on YouTube. But um, anyway, I, I geek out on this stuff. I geek out on it because when I was a teenager, I was obsessed with like, a lot of that sort of literature when it came to like ancient civilizations and uh, Graham Hancock, you know, who's not an archaeologist, he's a journalist, but people idolize him. But I used to read, I read his books when I was a kid. Uh, there's another, there's a bunch of them, right? You can go deep down the rabbit hole. But now as an adult, I look back at it like it's, it's kind of, but it's kind of interesting. It's an interesting conversation because for sure, ancient cultures are so fascinating. No, and a lot of them mirrored each other. Like you have pyramids in Egypt, you have pyramids in Mexico, you have pyramids in, uh, well, they, I'm not sure they're pyramids, but they had structures in uh, Bolivia. Yeah. Remember one of them they made with a stone that was harder, uh, that could only be cut with diamond. And they had chiseled patterns yeah. and whatnot. So like, how the hell did they do this? You know what I mean? I, I, there's, yeah. So, but, it, but it's interesting that different parts of the world were building these pyramids. Yeah. And so that's one thing, oh, aliens came in and they did it everywhere, or aliens inspired them but, to do it. Think about this. If you, if you ask your, you know, if I ask my daughters to build me a castle on the beach, you know what they're going to build? Yeah. A pyramid. Yeah. You know, because it's the most fundamental base. If you want to build something tall and you don't have the technology to build a skyscraper, what are you going to build? Yeah. It's a pyramid. It's the tallest thing you can build when you're lacking cranes. Yeah, because it's not an efficient structure because yeah. <laughs> yeah. the base is huge you know like as you get higher and higher so but it's the easiest tall structure to build when yeah, you lack a crane it's, and very stable right and obviously stable. i mean this lasts last thousands of years yeah. Yeah. so it's i mean and not only that the technology to build all these pyramids is completely different mm -hmm. why would the aliens be changing the technology come on people <laughs> and not only that if they're really going to give us something how about penicillin <laughs> Right? How about an iPhone? Like, how about like, like electricity back then? That would have been way more helpful than a pyramid. Why would they bring a pyramid out of all things? Yeah. I mean, 
I think there's a, there's a certain uh, I lose the word to describe it, but kind of like a synergy where I know they've documented this in there's this particular monkey in Japan that would that they introduced sweet potatoes to. And previous to it, they didn't know how to eat the sweet potato because it was sand all over it, so they would it wouldn't be good. One of these monkeys figured out they can wash the potato, okay. and then they were able to eat it. Okay. That monkey's tribe figured out how to do it by yeah. watching him, and they started all eating sweet potato. And the interesting thing that happened was that in different islands scattered across, all the monkeys started doing the same thing, like spontaneously. And they're like, how did this happen? Because the monkey didn't travel to these different islands to show the other monkeys how to do it. And uh, one of the ideas is that there's essentially a connected consciousness that after you reach a certain amount of, I guess, entities that pick up this knowledge, it suddenly just disperses everywhere else. And it's like how calculus was figured out like in three different places around the same, around time, the same period, time right? Um, so that's one way of seeing it. The other thing is just we're all very similar. We're going to yeah. come up with similar conclusions, right? Yeah. Like you said, like everybody, if you try to make a sand castle, it's going to be a pyramid in yeah. the basic level. So, you know, yeah. that's going to... A shared experience is going to be happening everywhere, you know? Since we're on the topic of ancient, you know, civilizations and the, the, the dawn of civilization, there's, it's an old, it's not a new book. It's widely known. You probably read it. Most people heard of it. Guns, Germs, and Steel by Jared Diamond. Uh, it's a classic. It's a must read. Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's a, it, well, they're basically, he's basically trying to explain why was it that Europe conquered the world. Mm. Of course, there's a racist, um, you know, um, claim, right, where white people are, which is, crazy because there's not a single tool that allowed for Europe to conquer the world that is actually European. Every single invention that made possible for Europe to uh, conquer the world was either from Northern Africa, from Middle East, or from China. Gunpowder, steel, bronze, uh, the wheel, navigation, cartography, you name it, right? It was, so it, clearly there's, you can't make that argument, right? It's absurd. But, but why Europe, right? Why not, why not the Middle East? Why not Africa? Why not South America? Why not Australia? Hmm. Right? So he goes on to answer the questions. He finds the answers in geography, the fauna and the flora available to people, right? So Native Americans knew, I mean, the Aztecs knew the wheel, but they never developed uh, a wagon. Why not? They knew the wheel because they used it in toys, yeah. right? But why not a wagon? Well, they don't have an animal to pull it. It's that simple. There are no horses around. Because the Clovis people, when they came over, they wiped out all the horses. The, America was full of horses, but they were easy prey because they didn't evolve alongside humans. So when humans made it across the Barren Strait, their easiest target, a lot of meat, go kill it. They wipe them out just like that. What are the Aztecs left with? Dogs, turkey, can't get that to pull a wagon. So what are they gonna do with the wheel, right? Plus they never reached the Iron Age, right? So they can't build like a, the kind of wheels that the Romans were building, right? So it's, it's uh, or the Bronze Age for that matter. So, um, but this is all, these are things can be explained geographically. They have nothing to do with intelligence. They have nothing to do with uh, ethnicity or race. They have to do with where are you located. And then he finds that the, 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 the dawn of civilization takes place in the Middle East. And there's a reason for that. That was a place where all the domesticated, uh, the animals that could be domesticated were located. Cow, horse, um, I think the, the duck, the pig. And, in, and that right there gave that region so many tools that they had an advantage over Australia that doesn't have any animal that can be domesticated. Yeah. There's not a single animal you can domesticate in Australia, indigenous Australia, right, for example. So it's an interesting approach because it kind of turns the whole, it explains Europe colonizing the world, right? Fascinating to read. If you don't like to read, there's a documentary on it, Guns, Germs, and Steel. Check it out. It's very interesting. and. Uh... I've heard something about that as well with seasons, like countries with long seasons and whatnot. Mm. They had disadvantages. Like uh, well, one of them, I think I've read was in Malcolm Gladwell's book. Uh, damn it! Not the. Um, I got one. I never read outliers. it. I have it. Out, outliers. Outliers. So like he was talking. Is about, that, that the one that he like? That's the one that blew him up, though, right? Like that's the yeah, one. Yeah, that's the one that made him. Yeah, I think that was his first like big one. Because well, the one gave it to me as a as a gift. I never read it. Well, he describes it in Asian cultures, like in China particularly, yeah. uh, and one of the things that famous for, for the work ethic, like how they, they work yeah, so hard. Yeah. And one of the reasons is that uh, that he had postulated was that the rice growing isn't seasonal; it's year round. 
you can always plant rice and they can always interesting uh, manage it or at least has a much longer season than yeah. like European seasons where winter you're not doing anything you know what I mean you're just sitting there and hoping you have enough reserves to last you the winter whereas I, I believe from my understanding that in, for rice you can plant it year round yeah and it is also has lots of micro components behind it like you have to manage the basin essentially it's like a, a giant pot if you will if it's not perfectly level it's going to affect the yield so every day it has to be managed the water level has to be managed every day the spacing between the different rice you grains, can't stop you can't stop <laughs> it requires high level of it, technique yeah right it's not just like throw it in there and you're done yeah like, there's a lot of moving parts that are managed daily so their toil is constant which means they have a higher they, they're going to have to work harder to get their food but it also requires a lot of technical precision behind it so that, that was one of the things that they had there that makes it different than like, you know, when you have winter, fall, spring, like it's going to change. Oh, 100%. Yeah, you know, that you're going to work hard in the summer or in the spring and then you're going to relax in the winter and hope you're... Yeah, you're if you're in an environment where things are giving you easy. I mean, you don't have to go back and, you know, so, you know the, the, the birth of civilizations. You can actually look at, you know, people around you. You get kids that are born rich. Yeah. What happens? How many of them, like, what is the push and the incentive to actually, you know... You know, strive when you know perfectly well that when your parents die, you're going to be, why kill yeah. myself, right? People get complacent. And in the, on the other end, though, I think when you're born in too much poverty, too, though, and everyone else around you is poor and never created an expectation to leave it. Yeah. Because no one around you is really going beyond, you know, yeah. leaving that circle. It, it's trickier, right? Like, they, they each have their own problems, right? Yeah. People are like, oh, I mean, it's probably better to be born rich than to be born poor. I would think, because you have much more chance for opportunity. Yeah. At the same time, there are unique problems to being very rich that can be appreciated if you're poor, because you, you, you just don't know it. You can't see from that lens. Right? And likewise, the, the rich person who doesn't understand the problems that a poor person would yeah. have. You know? It's like <laughs> they had Bill Gates once in a, what was it? I think it was like The Price is Right or something. Some type of show like that, where you had to guess the prices of groceries. Man, he had no idea what's going on. He's clueless because, he, I, of course, he doesn't have the time. He's a personal shopper, you know. No, so I, I don't he, think he's ever. He, yeah. he went like a bag of potato chips, like a frozen potatoes, yeah. like twenty five dollars. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm like, funny. I'm like, either yeah. he's got something <laughs> ripping up the hell off, <laughs> you know. He just has no Cause idea. Because to him, a dollar and a hundred dollars makes no difference. He like it does. Yeah. He's not even. It's like to us, like a penny and a dime makes like. It's not that. Yeah. That's him, like a thousand dollars and ten thousand yeah, dollars. He's, the he's dealing in billions, you know what I mean? And he's not. It would be silly for him to deal with that. Yeah, you know, he's got bigger problems to fry. You know, yeah. but it was funny. You know? They were showing it. It's like, oh God, I've never seen someone so poorly. <laughs> they got no <laughs> idea funny, what's going man. on. Yeah. That's good TV right there. I love to see that. Yeah, yeah. man. But um, it, it it was interesting, and the whole where you are is very important. Like in how you come up, right? Like you were describing, like. Just with the countries, like, you know, the different places you are give you different advantages. And you have to understand how to use them. You know, I think probably the Europeans did a really good job of getting resources from other people as well and making it their own. I don't think they had any, like, not as many ideological problems as grabbing someone else's stuff and making it their own and running away with it, you know? Like, uh, it's kind of fascinating. And it applies to our martial arts as well. You oh, know, like, 100%. Depending on where you you started training, if you were limited in scope of what you could use, like you might have stagnated. You know, like if you trained a school that was very traditional, you never would use leg locks, right? If you're doing BJJ back in like late '90s, early 2000s, you would have been frowned upon. I know. Yeah. I, I went to a couple of places and they would heal people, and they would before even locked it, they would tap it with like disgust. Yeah, right? like, like mad at you. Yeah. Like, and I, I didn't get it at the time. I was like yeah. twenty. I'm like, what's the the, the, the environment is huge, man. No right. doubt. Um, you like know, made a point about like just a second ago about like being poor and being rich. Yeah. And just for someone, just like a memory. Um, I was in the favelas with Tater Day back in the day. Tater Day was in his prime. You know, I was training under him, and uh, like he took us to the favela once to stay with him, right? It was quite an experience because I didn't grow up poor in Brazil. I wasn't rich, but I didn't grow up poor either, yeah. right? I was middle class. And, but it was quite the, the social experiment. And I, I, I did remember, though, that probably the happiest people I've ever seen in my life. And I think that the reason for that is because they've given up on being rich. There's no expectation. There's no pressure. When there's no pressure, it's like, just enjoy every second of it, right? Yeah. They were very, very, like... I'm not saying I'm suggesting I want to live like that, but it's it's always it's, it's interesting to remember like how 
happy they were. Always smiling, man. Like, I didn't see a single person pissed off in that place. Well, it, it, you know, I mean, you could find native tribes or whatnot that have no access to any technology or modern amenities. And don't know what a stress is. Yeah, and, and yeah. they're perfectly happy with their existence, right? It, we have, that's why I always say, like, first world problems, first right? World because problems, yeah. we've created, we've changed the game <coughs> of me. what it is to be successful. Yeah. You know? From an animal point of view, successful is surviving, surviving and Having procreating. Babies, procreating you know? yeah. That would be the ultimate success. You know, you're able to spread your, your genetic material you want, right? Whereas now, like, that's not enough for some people. You know? Now it's like, well, we have to spread knowledge or we have to you know, accumulate wealth or whatever the, your gain that you've made. But it's, you can, that's when people think they get stuck in that rat race because they think this is what it is. Like, no, you can detach yourself a little bit. Like, yeah. I always tell people, like, you can strip me of everything I've ever had and then throw me somewhere else and I'll find a way to make it work, you know? Like, the- and it's crazy how much time and energy we go into pursuing things we know perfectly well are not going to make our lives better and are not going to make us happier, right? Like, it's yeah. crazy because we are in the rat race and, like, we're all trying to get rich, got to get rich. And I, I'm in it, too. You are. Everyone is, you know? But then you put things in perspective and, like, you know... I know a lot of rich people, like very wealthy people. Yeah. But they're not necessarily, I mean, they, they're all, they got the they got problems too, man. They got their own it's, yeah, unique it's not, problems. It's yeah. a very unique problem. And I'm looking at them like, I don't envy your life, you know, but then you look at their house and oh, it's a nice house, you know, maybe I want that. <laughs> and then you're like, well, I have to do all that to be there? Do I really? It's my point is, it's, um, you know, I can't remember where I saw this. And I did mention this the other day. I hope it wasn't on this podcast, but I was having this conversation with someone. I don't remember what it was. But there's research that shows that people valued their social rank based off of not what they actually had, but how that related to their neighbors. Mm. So, for example, let's say you make 100 grand a year, right? Which is pretty good money, right? All your neighbors make 400 a year. You're pissed off, right? <laughs> but let's say you make 80 a year, but all your neighbors make 20. You're actually happier. Yeah. Because people were basing their how well they did in life not on what they actually had but on how well they were doing in relation to their neighbors. And what poor people, no matter how bad your financial situation is, you got to acknowledge that you live better than kings did 500 years ago. Kings did not have the luxury that poor people have today in the United States. True. Yeah. They, were eating, they had more options for food. You probably didn't freeze. You don't probably have, you're probably not as cold as, unless you're living on, sleeping on the streets. Yeah. Like a castle looks like a really cold place to me. I don't care how many fires you got going on. Yeah. You know, like... You probably have more longevity, probably living longer. Your children are probably surviving, you know, your, your, your wife is more likely to survive childbirth. Yeah. So it is a better time to live no matter how poor you are. But the great question of the age is, are we happier? Yeah, and that's, uh, I think one of the keys to that is to focus on inside, right? Not, because everything around you can be taken away from you at a moment's notice, yeah. you know, but... As long as you're fulfilled from within, you'll always find a way to be yeah. happy. You know, like I think that's something that you were saying. Those people in the favel, they were happy because they've learned to be happy with yeah. themselves. And you know, it's internal, yeah, right? It's, it's, it's internal. It's, it's happiness it's, comes from within, yeah. and then it projects outside. But if you're looking outside to hope to fix it inside, it doesn't. It doesn't work, no. man. And I've met some really unhappy people in my life, and they were really like looking for happiness in things like vacations, mm-hmm. new car. Yeah. You know, I got to look better. Um, you know, it's always like if I win that jujitsu title, it's gonna make me. You know, and it's really at the end of the day, you have to live inside of yourself all day. When you look, and you, no matter how much you interact with other people, you spend a lot more time with who? Yeah. With yourself. No one keeps you more company than yourself. Right? Yeah. And when you look inside. You look at that picture. You got to look at that picture every day. What is inside? And if you're not proud of that, and you're not happy with that, there's no way you're going to be happy. You have to be able to look inside and go, all right, I'm not perfect. You don't want to be delusional and think you're, you know, no one is. You got to, we all got stuff to fix, but you want to be able to look inside and go, not too bad. And I'm actually pretty, I'm okay with who I am. You know, I like yeah. my, you know, I know what I know and I don't know, but I, you know, I, I'm proud of the fact that, you know, of, of the person I am, right? And if you have that, I think it's easier to get by no matter what you actually have in, in the material world, right? For sure. Yeah, but, you know, uh, like you don't need to have uh, all these possessions, these wealth, the fame. Yeah. All that's fleeting. That means nothing. Like in a million years, all that's going to be wiped out. It's not going to matter. You know, people are striving to make their mark so they could be remembered through history. Like, 
don't be foolish. <laughs> At some point, care. the plan <laughs> might be wiped out and we all exist and yeah. there will be no record that humans even exist in the universe, yeah. period, right? So like, yeah. don't worry about that. I think that. the pyramids would survive. I think one of the few <laughs> things that would survive. Computers wouldn't. Your Google Drive cloud certainly wouldn't survive. Uh, it's the pyramids that would survive. Yeah, so yeah. you have to be happy with yourself. And I think the best way to test that, put yourself in a room by yourself for a yeah. long time. And if you don't drive yourself nuts, you're doing okay. Right? Yeah. You could be content by yourself. Like, uh, have you ever done those isolation tanks? The flotation float tanks? tanks? I've done it once. Yeah. A uh, hint, hint, if you ever do one of those, do not let the water get in your eyes. It ruins, <laughs> so I'm serious, it's it, very, it, it ruins the whole trip. Yeah. Because it, your eyes are so, like, it, so, it, uh, it just uh, stings, right? Yeah. And you got to stop and go outside. And it's, it ruins the whole trip. No saying, keep your face dry. Yeah. Because yeah, mine was ruined because of that. Oh, it's very high saline water. Yeah. It's super salty because you can, you're literally floating on salt pretty much. Yeah. It's like being like, I guess, in Salt Lake or whatever. Yeah. But yeah, like it, it is an interesting experience because you're in there by yourself for like an hour and after a while, you're like, you're just floating in your thoughts. You know? yeah. And if you have like toxic thoughts or ideas, they're going to come out and... Yeah. It's a mirror to who you are. Yeah. Like, and that's why I like spending time by myself. I think it was Joe Rogan who was saying one of his stand-up comedies. I, and I love Joe Rogan's stand-up. I think he's brilliant because he's not just trying to be fun. He's constantly making good points. And I think that's the perfect com- That's The good comedy has got to be intelligent. Insightful, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And he's talking about like the, the worst thing you can do. People don't like that much to be alone. And I think what he, was, he meant by that is like, we need alone time. We all do enjoy that. But like we do like people as well because yeah. the worst thing you can do to a criminal is leave him alone. Yeah. Put him in solitary confinement. That's the worst thing you can do to a criminal. Like, and that's true. Like, fuck, man. But I do enjoy my alone time. You know, even though I am a people person, but I do enjoy my alone time. And that's why, like, I travel a lot for seminars and stuff like that. He's like, Rob, don't you get tired? I'm like, yeah, waiting in line sucks. People, you know, losing your luggage sucks. Again, you're having your flights canceled sucks and all that. But one thing I love about travel is that I'm alone for from four or five hours on a flight. Chances are you're not talking to anyone, right? Unless the person next to you starts talking, whatever. Sometimes you meet interesting people on flights, but mm-hmm. for the most part, you're quiet. And I do enjoy that because it is a way of like talking to myself. For sure. You, know, you look inside and then you, you know, and it's a way of challenging yourself, like challenging your own beliefs and your own, you know, and you try to solve your problems. And I, I love that exercise, man. Like, I really enjoy it. I like my alone time because I like to look inside. Because right. I want to see what's, you know, what, what, is, what is it I think about this? What's my opinion on this? And I'll be thinking for like an hour about what my opinion is on a given topic, anything. Yeah. Right. I think that's very important exercise. Yeah. You know, I, I spend a lot of alone time with myself. More than, like when I was in West Virginia, I was alone for like two years pretty much. Yeah. The only person I saw was my girlfriend. Like, like, <laughs> and that was it. So, I mean, to me, that's, I always tell my brother, I'd rather be in solitaire. Yeah, I I, 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 I know people. I don't like want to get yeah. into the rape or shame. That's true. I think I'd rather be alone. <laughs> I can deal with being alone, you know. Uh, but yeah, if you can't do those type of things, like, or you have to constantly be stimulated by external stimuli, like, I, I, we've talked about this before, and you, I think you and Frank also said the same thing. You don't listen to music in the car. I, I always drive silent. You know, when I'm at home working on the computer, there's no music or anything. It's just silent. Yeah. yeah. And I just think, and uh, that's very helpful. It keeps you in touch with yourself, and it keeps you honest, you know, because if you don't hear yourself, you don't talk to yourself. You know, people think, oh, that's, you're crazy. Like, no, like, you got to actually talk to yourself because you might actually think things or you might find out things about yourself that you're deep-seated, subconscious stuff that you never got out of you. You know what I mean? Like, if you ever do, like, deep meditations or whatnot, yeah. you, you pull out stuff from your There's a lot more that, in there than you, than it, that's on the, the surface, right? Because yeah. we typically see the surface, but yeah. it's interesting to, to go way down in there and, you know, see what else is out and what else you can, um, you know, what other aspects of your personality or, you know, just learn more about yourself. Like, know thyself, right? Yeah. It's a pretty old saying. Like, I think it's valid and it's always going to be. And I think... Ultimately, is you know, and I think just to finish off because like I, I gotta go, but like life is a journey about self discovery about 100%. all. Like you get to the end of your life, and I'm I'm thinking that I'm gonna be my deathbed sometime, you know, hope like sometime in my <laughs> 70s. I don't know if I'll make it that far, but and it's gonna be like, oh wow, I think I know myself now. You know, it's crazy, but you spend your whole life just to get to know who you are. Yeah. Right. But I think that's 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 what the journey is, man. It's just a journey of self discovering. There's nothing else. I mean, there's more to it, but like, that's like key component. 
I think yeah. it's a very big part of it. And if you don't embrace that, then you kind of fumble around for a long time. Yeah. You know I mean, you can, you can follow the motions of society. Okay, you get married, you have kids, you work, you retire. And, but if you never take the time to really like, discover, like you said, like, who you are, what you want, what are your desires, what are the things you, you're, you're longing for, then like, you're going to end up like, wondering what if, what could have been. True, true. That's my biggest fear, man. Like, that's one of my biggest fears is being in my deathbed and wondering what if. Like, I don't want that, man. Yeah. I want to be able to say, like, I, everything I wanted to do, I did. I've been to every country I wanted to visit. I tried all the foods I wanted to try. And, like, all the things that I, to me were interesting, I had, like, I, I, you know, dove into it a little bit. And I go, okay, this is, I have, I, I know a little bit about it or I experienced it a little bit. To me, that's important. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, Dave, this is a pleasure. I got class in about... 20 minutes, I gotta go grab my gi. Yeah. Um, this is a, it's a pleasure to be back. We haven't filmed in a while, so it's yeah. good to be back, and uh, I hope you guys enjoy. We didn't talk a bunch about jujitsu today. No, well, although no. we talked about aliens and pyramids and, you know, <laughs> life philosophy and everything, but I think it all comes back to jujitsu in a lot of ways, man. Like, I, I, I can talk about just about anything and find a way to use a lesson in jujitsu on, you know, on that topic, to do that, you know, to help me in that topic. Like, I, I, I draw so much experience from fighting. Yeah. You know, and it's taught me so much that I really call. I mean, I'm, I know it sounds like crazy, but like it's not. It's based on religion. That's how I look at jujitsu and fighting. It it is what it is my what gives me a, a sense of morals and you know right and wrong. It's like I got that through fighting because those ingredients are all there. You just got to pay attention. For sure. You know, like just try to be a better version of yourself, and that's those lessons are on the mats. That's the value of the martial arts. Yeah. For most people, because most people will never get into a physical altercation that requires them to do it. Like yeah. at least in a life-threatening situation, you might get into school fights, but that's BS. Yeah. But like a real self-defense scenario that you have to save your life, I haven't encountered one yet. Yeah. I got into school fights, but nothing that I really needed to learn how to fight. Yeah, you know I mean? self-defense so, doesn't. It's not the. It's not the ultimate motive. Yeah, and, you know, God willing, I, I, I never have to. Right. Yeah. And but if that's all I got for the martial arts, then I wasted my time. But I've got. I agree. I got a lot. What, what a poor experience. Yeah, yeah. It would have been like, oh, I wasted, I guess, twenty three years of my life. <laughs> I'm not that scared of getting my ass kicked, you know. Yeah. Like, if it happens, it happens plenty of times when I was a kid, you know. Yeah. So there are more important lessons to learn on the mats for sure. Awesome. All right, Dave. Thank you from very much. Thank you guys for listening, and uh, we'll see you guys again next time. Thank you. Ciao.